I thought since we were going to begin with chapter 46, and since I had not been working especially on the Book of Mormon all summer, neither have you, that a brief review might be in order. Be in order. Of course, that was a mistake. Uh, the Book of Mormon is like uh, the great jo uh, Justice Gallagher, Joseph Justice Gallagher, the greatest scholar ever lived, said Arabic is, Arabic is like a, the devil. You reach at your finger and it'll grab your arm and then farewell to peace of mind forever after. It won't ever let you go. And the Book of Mormon's that way too. You reach at your finger and it'll grab your arm. But uh, we've been able to avoid it rather well until now. We skip through it, as I say, we pick our way through gingerly as if we were going through a minefield, avoiding all the unpleasant passages. Well, we're not going to do that now, but in this review brought out certain things, which I just noticed this morning. Every time you read the Book of Mormon, you find all sorts of things. We're talking about the recurrent themes in the Book of Mormon. Something I discover in the first 45 chapters, there are eight recurrent themes that recur all the time. These keep going over and over again. They're extremely important. And the second half of the Book of Mormon, they become intensified. It builds them up, become very exciting then. So let's see what these themes are now. And we'll call them the recurrent themes. Just give them a name. We'll, the Germans call them Hauptthema, uh, the uh, various names for them. Light motifs, you call them light motifs, hop tema motifs. Uh, we're calling them the recurrent themes because they keep coming over and over again. Boy, my writing is getting worse and worse. Well, so am I. The, uh, and so we start out, uh, I'm going to save you some trouble here. Now, you always bring your Book of Mormon. After all, it's our text, the only text we have. It's a very good one, you know. It's, uh, it's basic to this course. Is there anyone who doesn't have a Book of Mormon? Who doesn't have a Book of Mormon here now? That should be disastrous, you see. Well, we'll skip through now and we'll consider these things and they're, they're very important and they're extremely relevant. So first of all, we start out in the opening right at the beginning, the seeing many afflictions and highly favored and so forth. And he starts right out telling us that the great city of Jerusalem was going to be, the fourth verse, repent or be destroyed. And that is the theme of destruction. Now we, met, we mentioned that the last time. We notice all of a sudden we've discovered, they had reason to, to know it all along, here we walk around on the, on the fossil remains of previous ages of the earth. They're all, they're all deposited under us, but they're there. And we're gonna make a deposit too in our own time. And the, the theme here is that the, we mentioned that the last, the June Geographic, that extermination is now a basic theme in the history of of geology. There have been per periods of extermination. Uh, that was introduced by Schindewolf, a German uh, archaeologist in the 60s, uh, called neocatastrophism. The idea that there had been a series of catastrophes. It was sort of put down when he came out with it, but now it's fully accepted. The history of the world has been a series of catastrophes. They've been regular catastrophes, cyclical catastrophes, which can't be avoided because they, their cause is outer space. We said it was either Either the Oort cloud, or it was the, or it was the uh, the planet Nemesis, uh, the star Nemesis, and so we have this thing, and we've noticed this in human history, the same thing. We go through a series of destructions. The Earth is destroyed. This is what the Book of Mormon's about. Now, for example, this theme of destruction, First Nephi one and four, uh, it comes out again in the words of Mormon. <laughs> they're, they're nearly completely wiped out. He starts out saying there's almost nobody left. The whole thing is gone now. But the big destructions come later on, of course, with the, with the time of Christ and the Jaredites and the rest. So we have in the history of the world all these, uh, all these destructions. And it begins with why was Jerusalem destroyed? Does it necessarily have to be so? Well, Jeremiah 5.25. Now, Jeremiah was a friend of Lehi. He was a contemporary. He knew him very well. That's very plain from the Book of Mormon. He belonged to that group. We don't go into that this semester. But just that 25th chapter, the, the fifth chapter of Jeremiah explains why. The 21st, and very briefly, it'll tell you why, because the people were proud and corrupt, and the rich were, were proud, and uh, the, the poor were oppressed. There was no justice. Everybody was out for money. Everybody had their hearts set on wealth. That theme, the fatal theme in the Book of Mormon, they set their hearts on riches. 
So we have this, this rottenness and so forth. But we have the whole lamentation literature, the earliest records we have, we go but start back in the old kingdom of Egypt, we have what they call the, the uh, admonitions of an Egyptian sage back in the early time. He describes the complete collapse of the old kingdom. It, it all fell for the very same reasons we have this. Then the great Babylonian lamentation literature has been collected by Lambert in one large volume, Oxford volume, you can look at it here. The lamentation as if these things must come and so forth. And uh, the, well, after all, Enoch, what is he doing? He is, he is prophesying, warning against the destruction of the world. And it came and it was complete. See, in the time of Noah, there was one of those great upheavals that do take place. And uh, in the time of Lamech, we're told how the evil spread abroad and so forth. In the time of Cain, the, the nature, we're always sinning and we can't keep out of it for some reason or other. Now, let's see what we have here. We have... Uh, you have the, this has always been recognized, that human history always seems to be running downhill. They're always running downhill. Well, of course, that's, I guess, that's, that's entropy. That's gravity. Gravity sucks us all down. We're all being, we're all being conquered by gravity every day. You see, I, I'm beginning to sag at all points here. There's no way I can, <laughs> there's no way I can avoid it. I'm sorry about that. But uh, this is what happens. We all yield to gravity. We all take it downward. So we have great epics. Well, we begin, you see, we begin the Old Testament with, with Adam in, well, put a great price too, with Adam in the garden, in the world as it should be, in a heavenly place, and then he gets out, he's kicked out. And then he starts cultivating the earth, and then the book, the book of Moses and Abraham is marvelous for this, and then we see the stages by Adam and Eve accepted the gospel and rejoiced in it, but their children all turned away from it, and they mourned before the Lord. They did the best they could to save their children, they could do nothing about it. They had, uh, had Cain and Abel, they had lots of children, but then uh, Cain, loved Satan well and his people they loved Satan more than God and they would not listen to Adam and Cain made his covenant with Satan and things get worse and worse and then with Lamech the evil spreads among the whole human family everything's going downhill well this is basic philosophy of history too of the ancients themselves the most famous being of course Hesiod's uh, the uh, called the Theogony two works and works in David put Hesiod I suppose you all know who Hesiod was. I'm going to stop asking questions because that's a fatal mistake when we ask questions anymore. It used to be you could get some answers, but no more. Our kids don't know anything about it. <laughs> some of you may have seen that long article by Carl Sagan. Yesterday, all those ghastly statistics about American education were just about as low as we can get. Well, we can attest to that. But uh, Hesiod, remember, has introduced... Now, he's writing at the time of Homer. He's writing about 770 B.C. He's writing back there. And uh, he's writing on a much older basis. Namely, that about the Golden Age, in the beginning there was the Golden Age, followed by a Silver Age, followed by a Bronze Age, followed by an Iron Age, followed by an Age of Clay. You rec recognize those as the figure that Daniel saw. Remember the head of gold, the shoulders of gold, and so forth. In other words, we decline. Each generation is a little worse or a lot worse than that which went before. Must that necessarily be so? Well, that's so because of our nature. See, we have to be that way. The troubles of our proud and angry dust are from eternity and shall not fail. We run down, or as Job says, man who is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Well, if we're made in that sort of a way, uh, how can we avoid it? It's a fine thing to turn us loose here. Thou who didst man of baser metal make, and who with Eden didst create the snake, for all the ill with which the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. That's from the Rubaiyat. In my day, every kid knew the Rubaiyat by heart. Nobody's ever heard of it today. Uh, but, uh, but that's it. See, we're made that way. So, yatong fato de Dios, wa as as Beatrice says to Dante, God just made me that way. I'm good and you're bad because God made me that way. That, well, that's predestination, you see. Uh, can you escape it? But this is... Uh, this is essential to this. Do we necessarily have to be bad and, and go that way? This is very often mentioned in the Book of Mormon, the theory. Is there a general theory of human behavior and so forth? Yes. And you'll find that uh, Nephi breaks out, second Nephi, uh, and third Nephi, and express themselves very warmly on this particular subject upon the decline, the impossibility, the unregenerate nature of man. Well, then you put him where he doesn't have a chance. What are we doing here? Well, it's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Statistically, we always go downhill that way, but that's no excuse for the individual doing it, you see. See, uh, Heisenberg showed that that applied throughout all science, the science building, I say it now. Oh, no, this isn't. This isn't a well, kind of a science building. Uh, but uh, 
You see, you can predict with absolute certainty how a mass of uh, atoms is going to behave, but you cannot predict at any time how any, what any one of those atoms is going to do. It can go off any time it feels like it. There's no way of controlling it. See, that's the uncertainty principle. And it's so with us. Uh, the world may go to hell in a basket, but that's no excuse for you. And that is what Lehi has told, and that's what we're all told as far as that goes. Because he has given us the plan and he has given us the help. He says, I'm going to give you all the help you want. I'll give you everything you need. All you have to do is accept it. And if you don't accept it, well, then you can't complain that your nature, you recognize your weak nature and ask for help and you'll get it. But we don't. We refuse it. See, when it's offered this way. So we have all these downhill things. Well, that's the fourth verse of Nephi already, the way things go. This recurrent theme of destruction. And, of course, the Book of Mormon ends with destruction. It ends with the most bleak and terrible and the saddest of destructions. It's, it's very sad. St. Lacrimi, as we mentioned the last time. And to, remember, your great epics all begin with the destruction of a civilization. The destruction of Troy being the classical example. And uh, when the city uh, is destroyed, well, eh, not just Atlantis, but all the others, but when the city is destroyed, what do you do? Well, then there is the second theme, the theme of survival. The very next theme that comes out here, which is get out. Lehi was told to, to get out, leave Jerusalem. He had it in a dream. He was told he would have to get out. And... Uh, so he's the one that makes an escape, and then this again is the theme. The, uh, uh, the idea of an, of an antique, an archaic civilization that was much higher than has ever lived since has been revived by an eminent scientist, by Georgi Santiana of, at MIT. The idea that there was an archaic civilization that had vast knowledge, we always thought that was a rather romantic, rather mysterious sort of thing, like the At Atlantis business and all this sort of thing. But there is evidence that that is actually, uh, is, is actually the case, that uh, uh, Jemshid and his seven ring cup have, have disappeared. What is it? The, and Balaam, they say the lion and the lizard keep the court where Jemshid uh, feasted and drank deep. And Balaam, that great hunter, the wild ass stamps o'er his head but cannot break his sleep. The great Jemshid, you see, was the greatest of all, but he lived before and those have all gone and they all rest now. But the idea that there had been at the very beginning, things were better off. In other words, that evolution has been downhill and not uphill. It's the very opposite of what the Victorians taught. And the strange thing is now that, I mean, you get to someone like, like Santiana and they say there, there may be something, there may be more than something to that. The, uh, but there have been, so you choose, you get out, you two, and you're told to, to migrate here. And of course, they all migrate. Adam migrates. Remember, he leaves the garden. He has to take out into the lone and dreary world and establish himself. And then his sons and daughters scatter everywhere in it, throughout the world. And then after the flood, then Noah, 14th chapter of Genesis, they scatter. The three sons of Noah scatter in the three different directions. We're always scattering to repeople the earth and so forth. But the, when you go out, you choose the wilderness. But the... Uh, the main thing importance is the person who makes the escape. Of course, and there's the echo. See, there's, there's Odysseus. What's Odysseus? Uh, here's a good example. Uh, like Lehi, he's driven out and he wanders, and uh, he's, uh, he is not rescued from, from uh, Troy. He destroyed Troy. He had more to do with it than anybody else. But then uh, Andromeda Pamusa, Polutropon, Hos Malapola. He was a man who was forced to wander many places, Hos Malapola, and suffered very many evils. Plagnthe, a Petroie, and had to suffer after he had driven from Troy. Polodhon Anthropon, Idenas Jakai, No Onegnos, and he saw the ways of many men and saw the customs of many nations. Arnimnos, Hain kind Nostrum Hitiron, seeking to get home to save his own life, Hain to his own psuche, his own life. He's seeking to save his own life and those of his companions, but he failed to save them. Nay, Pioi, because they were foolish. They, were, they couldn't control their lusts and their appetites, and they were destroyed, and they never got to see their homes they wanted again. Only he came through, only he came through alone. See, it's the righteous man, the lone survivor in the desert, and the Book of Mormon is full of those lone survivors. You notice that. There's, well, this getting out. Let's see some of the, uh, the second, in the first chapter here, but we have in uh, Second Nephi, the fifth verse, when after they settled in the new word, Nephi must depart, and he must leave the people because his people have become corrupt then. And he goes out and it says in, uh, it's in 2 Nephi 5, he goes out with the people that will follow him. 
and they go out by themselves and settle, and he builds a temple, and they live after the manner of happiness. See, it's not, it says after the manner of happiness, it's not necessary to suffer uh, the way people suffer. They don't have to. See, if they would only do that after the manner of happiness. And it tells us what the secret is of living after the manner of happiness. It's, it puts that in a very nice way. It says to, to like the things that God likes. That's the things that will make you happy and you'll, you'll get along fine because then you have what you want. Well, there another getting out here then in Omni 12 tells us how Mosiah, now from Nephi's new ideal community. See, he goes, Lehi comes, he leaves Jerusalem, he settles in the new world, his ideal society. There's a pure, they're away from the world, they've saved themselves in the wilderness, see. They go bad, so Nephi leaves them. Now Nephi's community goes bad, and Mosiah breaks off. He's told in the dream to leave them. So, so then Mosiah breaks out in Omni 12, he goes out, and he's made king in Zarahemla and so forth. And then again, in Mosiah, book of Mosiah in the seventh chapter, Ammon goes to the land of Nephi-Lehi and finds a Mulekite enclave that's discovered there. And then we have Zenith's story. Zenith went out and they went bad. And then we have in the 17th chapter of Mosiah where Alma, remember he's under pressure, he was a priest of King Noah, and he had to get out to save himself. But he went out with a community. They organized themselves in the wilderness at the waters of Mormon and had an ideal setting there. But it didn't last again. They, they caught up with them. And then under Lamanite pressure, Noah took off. Of course, there, Noah and his priests, there's another one saving themselves, you see, rescuing themselves. Hange of the Cain, Kainost, and Atiron to save his own life and those of his companions, you see. And Alma gets out and uh, by the waters of Mormon, and then Noah leaves, I say, and then the Lamanites take the women from another community. And then the 21st chapter, 23rd verse, Alma meets Limhi, and together they form a combine and, and they break off. They make a break because they're living under uh, Lamanite pressure here by King Laman. Uh, and they make a pressure. They make a break and they escape to Zerahim. Everybody's always breaking out and escaping throughout the Book of Mormon, you notice. And then Alma is, uh, Alma meets Limhi and they take off to Zerahim. But then in the 23rd verse, the next chapter, the next chapter, Alma is forced to move again, and he makes a city of his own. And he won't be king, and then his rival Amulon comes along and becomes so oppressive. Uh, there, it's an old rival. He's an old priest of, the, of Noah, too. And he hates, he hates the sight of Alma, and he oppresses him as much as he can because the overlord, the Nephite overlord, has made him local king over Alma's people. That's the worst thing that could happen to Alma. So some fine night, they make a break, and they leave, too. And so he gets out, and he ends up safe in Zarahemla in the 24th chapter. Well, does anybody else get out here that we noticed? The, uh, then we're going to see lots of other escapes like that. So you get out. Uh, you're going to be destroyed, so you get out. That's the next thing to do. That's logical enough. And you choose a wilderness. Remember, it tells us in the book of Jared, of course, it's a marvelous book. That's absolutely indispensable here. We have to have that. The Jaredite story, the book of Ether. They, uh, they go to that place where there never had man been. They go to a land that had never been occupied by human beings. It has to be a real wilderness as far as that goes. But, uh, and they're always going to wilderness as here as that goes. Uh, the, this is an interesting thing here that you have, uh, we don't have no wilderness. The saints went to the wilderness, as you know. Israel, Moses left the Egyptians and went into the wilderness and wandered 40 years in the wilderness. They're always going into the wilderness. The prophets always go out to the wilderness. They retire. Elijah goes out and hides in the valley and so forth. The Qumran people have to imitate that. They feel this is the Rechabite doctrine, that when Israel becomes bad, becomes wicked, when Jerusalem becomes wicked, the pious go off and live by themselves in the desert and wait for God to give them more revelation. That's the theme of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those people went out to Qumran to do that very thing. So we have the Rechabites. And we're told in the 35th chapter of, of Jeremiah that Jonadab ben Rechab, the Rechabites, Jonadab ben Rechab and his son were, were righteous and they were so blessed, they were the only people that were not corrupt in Jerusalem. They were blessed by giving special offices in the temple forever after that. But they went out in the desert to live by themselves. And their theory was they would not live in houses of stone and they would not even cultivate the ground. They would live as John the Baptist lived. See, John the Baptist was another one who went out into the wilderness. Why have you come out into the wilderness? He's a contemporary of Qumran, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we're told that he was a wild man and that he lived on wild locusts and honey and he dressed in camel's hair and so forth, and he scared people. And when Enoch appeared, the people said, a wild, there's a strange thing in the land, a wild man has come among us. 
And we know from the Jewish sources that when John the Baptist appeared, people said, who is he? They said, he is Enoch. And they asked him, who are you? And he said, I am the man. Uh, Josephus tells us, Josephus never gives the name of John the Baptist. He tells us his story, but he never gives us his name. Because when they asked him who he was, he said, I am Enos, which just means the man, and they, they took him for Enoch. This idea of the one who goes out and lives in the wilderness uh, to, as a, a witness against the, the sins and follies of the human race, you go out by yourself. People try that all the time. The saints were driven whether they wanted to or not. We didn't stage this, you see. The Mormons didn't stage it, as George Albert Smith Sr. said. We came out here of our own free will because they made us. The desert wasn't our day yet. Others, there have been plenty of sects, there have been plenty of sects, you see, that have, uh, that have imitated that. The, uh, that's what St. Anthony did. You see, St. Anthony was a rich fellow who lived in, in, in the fourth century in, in uh, Alexandria. The city was thoroughly corrupt, a thoroughly Christian city, but it was always corrupt. So he goes out into the desert, lived by himself, and starts the monastic movement. Pacomius, the, the uh, native Egyptians, uh, participate in that and becomes a great movement. The whole idea that a monarch, a monk, is one who goes out and lives by himself, who is in the wilderness. You seek yourself, in, there are the two kinds, there's the desert, the, the monasticism of the desert, and monasticism of the sea. You choose the island or you choose the desert. And they did. The idea was that the only way you could live purely, the only way you could keep yourself unspotted with the world, to get out and live in the desert. And they did in a great floxum, as you know, from the fourth century on, and then in Italy, Monte Cassino uh, in, in the sixth century, the Benedictine order, and then it spreads and then up in, in England, and then in, be, they become the, the mendicant orders in the 13th century, St. Francis, and so forth. But this is always popular, that you had to go out and live by yourself. And, of course, that had problems. <laughs> they all became rich and corrupt, uh, all of them. But we can't choose a wilderness anymore, can we? Do, oh, yes, yes. There's always an artificial wilderness. You can always make a wilderness. And most of the wildernesses people have moved into have been those created by the follies of men, and there are such wildernesses. <laughs> now, uh, there's a recent work, a, a very interesting, very rather thorough uh, aerial survey of England that shows where there was a great civilization in England, 40, 4300 BC, uh, or earlier than that. Uh, but at least that early, say most of North England was under dense cultivation, farms, uh, fish ponds, orchards, villages, towns, everything, and then it was completely disappeared, and then it was completely covered by something else. And then it happened again, it happens again and again. Strange things happen here. Again and again, the world has been depopulated to a greater degree than we realize. Of course, you think of the, of the plague in the time of Marcus Aurelius that wiped out most of the population of Europe in the Near East, well, it started in the Near East. And then you think of the, of the 14th century, 1340s, when the plague uh, depopulated four fifths, some countries, some communities completely. Well, in England, you see, you see a totally new culture, totally new village culture, a way of doing things, type of farming, emerges suddenly after the Black Death because it just depopulated the land. As you have your artificial wildernesses, people get themselves into this trouble and then the world is desolate. In the Mycenaean, they're uh, in the year, see there, well, that's the, along this getting out, you, what you have is the migrations, the great migrations, the people migrate. But there are times when everybody's migrating and nobody knows who's in charge and nobody where to settle. Terrible times, and this is one of the times we're living in the migration. There, 3000 BC, there was such a time. The whole world was, became homeless. It was, the weather was behind it too. They had bad years, they had to move. Uh, the great uh, heartland of, of Asia, the crops failed, the people are living on a, on a uh, marginal, economy, you see, and when the, the grass doesn't grow, they have to move with their, they wander with their flocks, the central hosts of Asia, and they infringe upon the, the, out, the outlying communities, uh, civilization. The civilizations are all on the edge, you see, the Chinese, the Indian, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the they're all right up on the edge of the heart, what's called the heartland, and, and that's the basis of geopolitics. That's uh, Alfred McKindle's geopolitics on which Hitler based his aspirations and his empire. He had a uh, he had a geographer called Haushofer who <laughs> invented this geopolitic which was behind us. But this is, it still runs the world as far, far as that goes. We're thinking in, in these world terms, but these desolations and these artificial, we, because wars are so unpleasant, we often forget, completely forget, how great the destructions were and that it was another people there entirely and they disappeared completely. When, there's, when the uh, destruction is in tens of millions, we forget that it does change the scene and we start out we we'll say, this is a fresh beginning, and we'll just put that all behind us. We like to say that, and we do. And so we forget how many times this sort of thing has happened, and how hard it hits, and when it hits, how great the destruction is. The, uh, 
it's a funny thing, but of course, the destruction's in Germany. Well, but those people were all gone too. They were, they were destroyed. I never forget sitting on the fountains. He, uh, Ludwigshafen was the old capital of, of Baden, a very aristocratic city, a, a Baroque city, a beautiful city, designed one of those marvelous Baroque cities on the Rhine, and uh, is the capital of Baden, you see, and I was on mission part of the time there. There I was. And after the mission, I went back to the same place. It was during the war, you see. We'd just been occupied there. And I sat on the, the fountain there. There was a, a very famous fountain, a horse fountain with magnificent horses on it, in front of the palace there. Well, there was no palace, there was no horse fountain, there was no, nothing left. I sat on the, the red sandstone remains. It might just as well have been the Mojave Desert, and I ate my lunch. And there were flies there, and there was a lizard that scampered across, scampered across the, uh, the red sandstone. And I thought the lion and the lizard keep the courts here. Because here it was, the, this civilized center, uh, one of the peaks of civilization, of, the 18th century, and here I was sitting on its ruins and eating by a fountain. It's just as, just as ruined as Babylon, it's just more ruined than many a place in Egypt, and here it was you know, right in Germany where I'd been on a mission. Knew all these things. Uh, it's a very impressive thing. There, there was nobody there at all. I could, the whole city was just empty. I could go take anything I wanted, to, to loot if I wanted to. There was nothing. It was all gone. And this happens in place after place. The mayor of uh, Pforzheim, another place not far from there, told me in the last air raid, the British air raid on that town, a town of 80,000 people, he said, uh, 30,000 were killed in that one air raid. What, what happens? And then we just forget about those things. So we have artificial deserts that we can move into as far as that goes. So, so don't worry about not having a wilderness to, to go into. We have this extermination. Then we have these swarming times. I say when everybody is disorganized, when everybody is disoriented. The Book of Ether is a classic treatment of that. Well, we wrote a book on that, The World of the Jaredites and so forth. And uh, this is called the, the heroic period, the epic period. It produces epic literature, a type of literature, and so forth, called the swarming time. But I say in uh, 1700, then in 1200, we mentioned Troy fell. Not just Troy fell, but everything fell. The Egyptian Empire, everything fell in 1200. Everything was corrupt. And then in 600, that was another pivotal date, you see, in Lehi's day. The old governments, the old sacral kingships, everywhere they disappeared. The same thing happens in 600, in 1200, in 1700. Uh, 2,400 and 3,000, about every 600 years it looks like that, doesn't it? And then uh, it's happening again. Well, now look at Beirut. I also used to live in Beirut, the most cultivated city in the East, the Switzerland of the East. All the people in, on the Near East, all the Arab sheiks and all the Egyptians, everybody, the Turks, invested their money in Beirut because they knew it was so safe. It was a safe and civil society. It was all full of banks and swank shops and things like that, the most sophisticated place of all. Uh, this was the old Phoenicia. They were very proud of the fact. In fact, we had a student here who was a, uh, a Lebanese girl. She became very angry if you said they spoke Arabic. You said, we speak Phoenician. Yeah. Well, they do have a dialect of their own, it's true. But, uh, and here it is, and look at today. You, c you couldn't find anything worse there. This whole city is a ruin. And the people have just been fighting each other. People that have been living in that city together for hundreds of years, the Christians and the Maronites and the Muslims have lived together there. And now the Sunni come in and fight the Shiites. Now the, the Shiites believe that it's a minor point of doctrine who is to be the successor of Muhammad. Well, that's not minor with them, but it's not a point of doctrine. But just about that, is it to be Ali or is it to be Omar? And so the one is the Sunnites and the other is the Shiites, and they're killing each other like crazy. The city has become a complete shambles, a complete room. That big, prosperous, booming, the most promising city in Europe. There's a place to put your money, safer than Switzerland. Now, it's not only the best city, it's the worst. It's just, it's worse than a slum. It's just a total ruin. You can see that on the news now. Gas, and nobody dares to go there anymore. You get picked up like that. So that's the world we live in. See, anything can happen when that can happen. If you had prophesied that 10 years ago, you'd say, they're absolutely crazy. You have no sense of history or anything like that. Ha ha. This is what happens. So then we come to uh, anything else about this. We've got our extermination. So our third motif here is the importance of keeping the book, the keeping the record. Why this importance of the record? It's constantly going to be repeated here. Uh, we have some, well, for example, uh, the 29th chapter of Second Nephi, he explains why the scriptures are to gather all things in one, a great unification. They're absolutely necessary to the project, you see, to orchestrate the whole thing, to bring it together. If this was just one disconnected series of tragic events, the thing would be a horrible mess. People think it is, but it isn't. It all fits into the same place. Plan. And the record's going to tell us that, and we're going to, God wants to keep the record, which shows us, I say, that the thing is, the thing is 
orchestrated here. It is, uh, it's, see, the, it, just as you bring an empire together, you couldn't have an empire until you had the written word, until you have writing. See, an empire has no control out of sight of the, the next country, the next people. He has no control. But if he has the written record, he sends his scribes out. They, they bring in the reports. He has the main office. He has the bureau. That's the center of empire. See, and I talked about that, the destruction of the Egyptian empire, the uh, Amenemet, the wisdom of Amenemet, the, uh, the Egyptian sage. There, there's quite a great wisdom literature, quite a great lamentation. They're, lament, they're lamenting for the destruction of everything, you see. And uh, well, a very important thing, he says, uh, the mob, with the mob breaks into the royal archives. They bring out all the records, including the tax records, take them out into the alleys and stamp them under their dirty feet, he says. And with that, the empire disappears, because if it's gone, it's gone. There is a, uh, uh, well, which one is that, where the, where the storm hits? Uh, there is a great, well, this is an, uh, an Arabic account. Great empire, I have to think of it now. Well, anyway, there was a great empire in the east, and uh, something happened, and there was a, a, a tornado came. A tornado came and scattered all the records, scattered all the papers everywhere, and the empire disappeared, because without the records, after control, you don't know who, who owns what or who owes what. You have no records. You have no account of anything. You have no control. So writing is not only the greatest invention of the human race, it's the greatest means of control and oppression, as far as that goes. All it takes is a name written on a piece of paper uh, to put a, an Arab oil sheik or a, a, Japanese, a Japanese consortium in charge of half the mountains in Utah here. They may never see them, but you, can, you can't go there now because they own them. Why? Because their name's on a piece of paper. That's quite a thing. I wrote a, an article on that called The Arrow, the Hunter, and the State in, in a political journal years ago. Uh, it stirred a lot of people up. But th that's it, you see. Uh, what, what writing does, that our society rep uh, rests on such flimsy things. But the written record is to, is, has this strange power. Of course, it's the, as Galileo says, it's, it makes all other inventions look like nothing. It is the invention. See, you'll never be able to catch things with a TV or anything like that hereafter. But uh, thousands of years ago, we have writings uh, right here. That we have writings right here, 5,000 years old. They still get their message across. It can be emotional. It can stir us very deeply after all those years. And all it took was a rock surface and something to scratch on it, and that's it. That's it. And you set up a, a TV broadcasting system or something like that. Well, that's very fragile, very brittle. That'll break down at 1,000 points. But writing can be preserved as long as any fossil, a million years as far as that goes. An amazing invention, isn't it? So this importance of the record, that's another point we make. I would say that, well, let's have it, see if I put them in order here. Yes. First, there's destruction, the geological and historical cycles. Then there's survival, this recobite motif, getting out. You're commanded to go out into the wilderness and survive there. If you can't find a wilderness, no, there'll be one made for you, don't worry. Uh, remember the yellow dog prophecy, that when the saints go back, to Jackson County. There won't be a yellow dog to wag his tail there. It'll be so wiped out. This would be the aftermath of a nuclear war. You can well imagine. If after that, there will be deserts. Don't worry. Plenty. <laughs> Places where it's not safe to go for 10,000 years, as a matter of fact. I don't like that kind of a desert. We're making for that sort of thing. And as the, there was Julius Caesar, who quotes a Gaulish chieftain, as saying, about the Romans. They make a desert and they call it a peace. Once the Romans have made peace, all you had was a desert. You, you dare not raise your finger. There was nothing there at all. The only safe Indian was a dead Indian, and we did that. We forget the great Indian culture of the eastern United States that we completely annihilated and so quickly. You can catch it in a few things, like that book, The Star in the West, but uh, very few records of that remained after. Oh, and so we get the next point, which is the Gospel plan. Now that is the Book of Mormon. You see, not only is a history, but as the history goes along, it explains what's happening. It takes us by the hand and shows us and gives a, a meaning to the whole thing. It tells us where we fit in and why this is not just a lot of nonsense and why we're being told this. It's very, very select, carefully selected and very uh, carefully edited. <coughs> and so we're conducted through here, and we find such marvelous gospel sermons. Now, the Book of Mormon has more gospel sermons than anything you'll find anywhere, and they go further to explaining what's going on in this world than anything else. You'll find such sermons in the 10th chapter of 1 Nephi, the plan with Christ as the center. 
a single unifier, unified plan. Of course, that's what the scientists are talking about today, a unified plan that will explain everything. That's what we want, because they're all connected somehow. And how can we explain them? Well, this is the theme in the Book of Mormon. It says, bringing things all together in one. It uses that. That's what the written word has the effect of doing. But the plan itself is explained here in Nephi chapters 12, 1 Nephi chapters 12 to 14. He shows the whole story, which would be pointless without it. We have a right to know, you see, when we're suffering these things, we have a right to know, but we refuse to believe. If, if the Lord tries to explain it to us, we do like uh, Cain. We turn on our heel and march out of the room in high dudgeon. Well, I'm not, going, I'm not going to listen to any more of this. Cain told the Lord, you see, in, in Moses there. And that's what we do. So when the Lord wants to explain, but it is explained and nowhere better than the Book of Mormon. And the 16th chapter tells us this is hard to take. Uh, it's a bleak story and so forth, but this tells us about the Leohona. Now, the Leohona uh, is a, all the help you'll ever want. We talk about the technical aspects of the Leohona, which are historical. The uh, Arabs do use such, uh, such guiding arrows to direct them through the desert, to spin on spindles, or you hold them on your finger and so forth. But uh, the point is here that the Lord will always give you guidance. He'll always give you hunna. He'll always give you guidance. But you must be in a frame of mind to receive it. I mean, when this is explained later to the young Mormon by his father, he says, look, he says, uh, these things don't work anymore. They work only according to faith. This is not magic. This is not a machine that does things for you, that tells you where to go. It's not a magic uh, wand uh, or a magic ring or book or robe or anything like that, that that operates itself no matter who has it. You can get the ring of Solomon, then you have the power of Solomon. You get the, uh, the king's ancus, then you have the power. No, it doesn't work that way. The Leohona only works like the Urim and Thummim, like seer stones and things like that for people who qualify and know how to do it, or any, any complicated device will work only if you know how to, how to use it here. If you're in the right frame of mind, you must be for the Leohona, as he explains to his son, to receive it. And there are Leohonas all around us. The, uh, the only thing that keeps us from receiving the message that's coming in so loud and clear is, is our vanity. We have it made up. There's a passage on Newton from, uh, from uh, I just thought of it this morning. Uh, this is in John Maynard Keynes' book on Newton. He wrote a, John Maynard Keynes, the brilliant uh, economist, you know, wrote this book on, on Newton, the man, it's called. And Newton was, you know, was the greatest scientist. Newton, uh, Aristotle, is the greatest scientist in history, as far as we know, for, for making significant discoveries, for thinking things through, the activities of the brain. But look in what a realm he worked now. He was willing to, he said, you can't do it without revelation. This is an important thing. He, the Newton's hymn, you know, the Newtonian hymn. Uh, how does it go? Uh, Praise the Lord for he has spoken, worlds his mighty word obeyed. Laws that never shall be broken has he for their guidance made. God has made his guidance. The laws of nature are guidance for the worlds which God has made for their guidance, you see. And we have to follow them. If you don't follow them, you'll be in the rough. You'll be, you're, asking yourself, you're asking for trouble. But Newton, this is about Newton here. <coughs> he says, why do I call him a magician? Because he looked on the whole universe and all that is in it as a riddle. Remember I said the last time the word read is the same word riddle. When you see a document in front of it, it doesn't speak to you itself. You have to apply your mind to it. We talked about that the last time, the importance of doing this very thing, of uh, uh, bringing these things to mind. All the book does is give you various hints and so forth. Uh, the book is not the real thing, see. Shakespeare says again, sit and see, minding by what they're minding true things by what their mockeries be. He says, this is just a play. Remember when we went through the 75th there? This is just a play. This is just a book. This is just a mock-up. This is just paper and ink. You've got to apply your mind to that. And to the degree to which you do, you can uh, find out that it will convey a great message to you. But you must apply your mind to a much higher state than you do just with your own intellectual powers. You must concentrate intensely, the most intense kind, of, which is prayer. You've got to pray about it. You've got to. That's not just joking about it. That's an intellectual operation he's talking about. And nobody realized that better than Newton. And nobody was able to make the great discoveries that Newton was able to make for that very reason. This is the thing. Uh, Jones, uh, uh, Ernest Jones, just after the war, they, the British appointed a, <coughs> a council to, to examine into the Royal Academy into why uh, science today is not very fruitful. It wasn't very fruitful at that time. And uh, he pointed out 
they said Newton's a great man in spite, and made great discoveries in spite of his faith on God and his prayers and all that sort of thing, failing to realize the point that it was only because of those things. <laughs> Not like General Grant's whiskey, I suppose. If, you, if, if that will give you the results, let's, let's do that, you see. So he says here, because he looked on the whole universe as a riddle, so he has to solve that riddle. This book is a riddle, you see. To read is to riddle, to unriddle. See, if it was in another language, in other characters and so forth, then you'd have to learn them and then you'd have to work them out. Devise, what is this talking about? What is he telling us now? It's a marvelous thing. I was so elated last night. I was read till three o'clock, silly. But I was reading Arabic, and I, the reason I was doing it, because of this darn class, it got me saying, well, have I forgotten everything? It's been years and years since I've done that. And so I started reading, and it's the darndest thing, you know. It all came back just like that. I haven't made any effort to hold it or anything like that, but somebody was pushing it all back there. Words I'd only seen once. I, knew, I remembered exactly the day I looked them up and exactly what it meant at the time. Oh, marvelous. But this is the way the thing hangs together. It's, there's no reason why it should do that, because look, as I say, there are no capital letters, there are no divisions between words, there are no vowels. Well, how can you read anything? There's no punctuation of any kind. And yet you can read this stuff. Well, that's against all the rules. You shouldn't be able to do it. Well, faith has a place to do in it. See, if you, if you panic, if you panic and think you can't, and this often happens to me, you panic, then it goes blank and you, might, you know, then you go blank because you lack faith, you see. You decide, well, I can't do it, I can't do it, it's not going to come. Well, you try to play or sing at a recital, you know that. If you suddenly panic, you'll, 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 you'll tighten up and you won't be able to play a note. You'll become terrified. So we live by faith. You must loosen things up and get things rolling by faith. Faith is not only the, the lubricant that thing, keeps things going, but it's the force behind it. But the force behind it is a force like the force of, a, of an airplane. It's a vacuum. It sucks you forward. You, you move forward into a vacuum when you learn things. Nobody's pushing you from behind. You move spontaneously into the vacuum. As soon as you're aware of that vacuum in front of you, you're sucked into it automatically because you can't resist it, you see. It'll pull you in. So this is the way we're drawn onward, and the this expression is used in the scriptures, you know. It drives you forward. Uh, we are drawn out. So he says, well, back to a riddle. As a secret which could be read by applying pure thought to certain evidence. Now, this was the folly of the Renaissance Reformation, too, and the Hermetic movement and all that go with them. Namely, that they thought it could all remain on the power of the human mind alone. They thought they were clever enough to do it, see. With the liberation that came, I won't say at the end of the human, uh, of, the, of the Middle Ages, because scholasticism was just as vain and just as intellectual, and they thought that by thought alone, you could see, this was St. This was Augustine's theme, that by thought alone you could prove the gospel, by thought alone you could prove anything you wanted to, and you were equal to anything. But this, when they discovered new devices, and they discovered new do documents like the great hermetic literature, then they became confident there was nothing they couldn't do, that the human mind was capable of anything, and they were fooling themselves because the human mind isn't. But aided it is, you see, with the Leahon, if God aids you, with this sort of thing, if you want to join him. Now, the Book of Mormon has a great deal to say about this, about the powers of the mind and what we can do uh, by, by faith. So he goes on here. Well, we'll get, get to the next sentence. Uh, as a secret, by applying pure thought to certain evidence, certain mystic clues which God had laid about the world to allow a sort of philosopher's treasure hunt to the esoteric brotherhood. So here was a brotherhood. See, like the people of Lehi, they go out and they keep themselves to themselves. There are always secrets in the church. And, but God has laid about these hints, treasure clues. It's a treasure hunt. But God has given us the hints. He's given us the clues. See, this is Leahona, pure and simple. It worked only according to their faith, you see. Then they would, then it would put them on to the road they were supposed to go. See, there are the two arrows. The one arrow is the, the stop arrow, and the other is the, it directs you. One says stop or go, and the other tells you the direct, points the direction you should go in. It says there were two arrows in the spindles, and this is the way the Arabs have done it in ancient times. This all came out since, long since Joseph Smith day. Well, to allow a sort of philosopher's to wear a treasure hunt, the esoteric, you know what esoteric means, that's those who have been initiated, know inside what it's talking about, those who accept it and, and are willing to give it a chance. You see, that's esoteric. There's exoteric, that, those who belong to the outside, the outside word, but esoteric is that esoteric, it's a comparative form, it means more inward, the people who are more inside than the outside. But the insiders know how to look for clues here that God has set them about, and a sort of treasure hunt. Well, they're there, it's true. Now, all the measure, these marvelous, the marvelous information we've been getting from the stars, the, the spectroscope and so forth, that evidence has been there all the time. The stars have been twinkling their light, they've given their colors and their brightness and all the, all the indices uh, of their nature 
nature have been there all these thousands of years. All we had to do was react to them. All we had to do was start thinking about them and look at them. And then we'd, have, then we'd react to, to what the stars really have to tell us. But the hints are there. And so he has here, he believed that these clues were to be found partly in the evidence of the heavens and in the constitution of the elements. And that is what gives the false suggestion of his being an experimental natural philosopher. He says he wasn't an experimental natural philosopher. That's only part of it. But also partly in certain papers and traditions. Now we're getting to the record. Newton actually believed that there were certain ancient papers and traditions that had been handed down in the manner of the Book of Mormon. We're talking about handing down the record. Papers and traditions handed down by the brethren in an unbroken chain back to the original cryptic revelation in Babylonia. Well, that's the hermetic literature that comes out here. And the uh, Chaldeas. Here are supposed to be the Chaldean records of Abraham. But the uh, thing here is that he not only believes in the present evidence, but also that this has been documented in the past. And he, he regarded the universe as a cryptogram set by the Almighty, just as he himself wrapped the discovery of the calculus. He discovered calculus, he uh, Leibniz at the same time. In a cryptogram, when he communicated with Leibniz, by pure thought, by concentration of mind, he riddle, the riddle he believed he would be, would be revealed to the initiate. And of course, that was the mistake of the Renaissance and Reformation. Why they broke down was because they believed by pure thought they could do it all. That they could pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Man cannot by searching, as Job says, 11th chapter of Job says, man cannot by searching find out God. You, you can search all you want. You can find out a lot of things. But you want God to help you if you're going to, get, going to find out how it all belongs together. He did read the riddle of the heavens. And he believed that by the same powers of his introspective imagination, he would read the riddle of the Godhead. See, that's going too far. Man cannot by searching find out God. The riddle of the past and future events divinely foreordained, the riddle of the elements and their constitution from an original and undifferentiated first matter, which is what we're talking about here, and that's what we're looking for today, is that ultimate particle, something beyond the quark. The, uh, so that he could read, it's beyond the undifferentiated first matter, originated, that's what it begins with, see, just one particle, begins with one type of particle, one type of matter, undifferentiated, he could read the divinely foreordained, the riddle of the elements in their constitution from an original and differentiated first matter, the riddle of health and immortality. All would be revealed to him. He only could preserve to the end. Now, this shows his, his neurotic state. And this, the reason these men were able to do such great things, they did force themselves all the way, but in the end, they didn't find it. See, they, well, you have Descartes, Leibniz, and all the rest of them. They're all doing the same thing. They realize we haven't even begun to use our brains. Now, if we start that, who knows? There's, immediately, they concluded, naturally, they jumped to the conclusion, there's no limit to what we can't find out. We can find out at all because we've been able to find out so much, and we've been neglecting it all these years. Now, let's put our minds to it, and we can go all the way. Well, they're still trying to do that. So this is the, neuro the neurotic condition in which you end up if you try that, you see. All would be revealed to him if you only could preserve to the end, uninterrupted by himself. No one coming into the room, reading, copying, testing, all by himself. No interruption for God's sake, no disclosure, no discordant breakings in or criticism. With fear and shrinking as he assailed these half-ordained, half-forbidden things, creeping back into the bosom of the Godhead, into his mother's womb, voyaging through strange seas of thought alone, not as Charles Lamb, a, a fellow who believed nothing unless he was clear as three sides of a triangle. But this is, this is what, the, uh, what the Book of Mormon gives us, this kind of enlightenment, the, the, the Leona, the mystery of the Leona is what we're talking about here, you see. It's, it's a type of thing, and it, we, we miss it. God will give it to us to aid our thinking. But you have to bring your mind to it, see. If you didn't think, then Leona wouldn't work, you see. It worked only according to their faith and according to their behavior. Because again, you see, you have to keep the line pure. If you start, uh, once you introduce corrupt elements, it's like producing Im impurities, impurities in a, in a conveyor. The impure copper is going to heat up. Uh, the more impure it is, the less good a conveyor it is. If it's perfectly pure, then you have a marvelous conveyor. <coughs> and that's what you have to be. We have to, so this purity of life was an absolute necessity to go with these other things, and the Leohona wouldn't work without it. You see. it would, as soon as they started misbehaving, it refused. But this applies to other things, to everything we do in our life. Now, uh, well, we did stop three of the points. Yeah, we have a couple more for the next time. But for heaven's sake, read the Book of Mormon and put your minds to it.